Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. Today's battle, which is a tier 9 domination battle here on the Greece map, features one of my favourite ships, and also one of my favourite players. This is Happer Fodder, from the North American server. General, all-round, nice guy, good egg, snappy dresser, scintillating conversationalist, and no doubt also attractive to women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what can I say, he's a nice guy. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the USS Benham. So, unlike a fair few of the recent ships introduced into the game, the Benham did actually exist, and it was not the Fletcher, although it kind of looks like one, unless you squint and look closely. Uh, the Benham was actually in service at the outbreak of war with Japan at Pearl Harbor, although it wasn't at Pearl Harbor, it was escorting the USS Enterprise to Midway, and it it didn't have a long career, but it did manage to pack a whole bunch in. It took part in the Doolittle Raid, the Battle of Midway, the Second Battle of the Solomon Islands, and the Battle of Guadalcanal, where it was sunk by a torpedo on the 15th of November 1942. She was the lead ship of a class of 10 Benham-class destroyers, and while she looks very similar to all of the other American destroyers and World of Warships, she had some distinct differences from both the ships that preceded and the ships, notably the Fletchers, that followed her. And it's the torpedoes. <laughs> so, that's a lot of torpedoes. Yeah, you ain't seen nothing yet. This thing has four quad launchers. It can put 16 torpedoes into the water at the same time. Actually, that's not strictly true because these torpedoes have a range of 10.5 kilometers with a reasonable speed of 65 knots. And the torpedo reload is only 85 seconds, less than a minute and a half. And it takes more than a minute and a half for these torpedoes to reach that maximum range. So you can actually have 32 of these torpedoes in the water at the same time. We'll come back to the Benham in a moment. For now, I want to talk about submarines. How does that seem relevant, Jingles? Well, there are actually two in play uh, on each team in this battle. And the reason I want to talk about submarines, do you recall in one of last week's World of Warships videos, I featured a battle where there was a destroyer player who was being cock-blocked by an enemy submarine the entire battle. And the enemy submarine did it by the simple expedient of ensuring that he always positioned himself. Oof, that was a big hit. Yeah, uh, this extremely well-played submarine uh, managed to cock-block the star of one of last week's videos in a destroyer by simply ensuring that he always positioned himself in front, sort of screening the rest of his team, but no more than about six kilometres away. Which meant that any time a destroyer tried to get close to launch torpedoes, the submarine would spot them. And it's an extremely brave, and when I say brave, I mean suicidal destroyer captain who tries to close in for a depth charge attack on a submarine who's just spotted him right in front of the entire team. On the other hand, if you like this submarine, and you're right out here on your own, a good 10 to 12 kilometers away from the nearest ally, well, why not close in for a depth charge attack? I mean, what's the worst that can happen? He's already been forced to submerge by the depth charge attack planes from the Alsace over there, and he has absolutely no idea that Hatler Fodder is closing in. Just keeping an eye open for oil slicks or sonar pings. There go the first set of depth charges. Hap has been spotted, that means the submarine just came up periscope depth, and that means the submarine is about to die. I mean, he instantly submerges again, but that just means he doesn't know where Happer is anymore, and Happer has a fairly good idea, although the team have just lost one of their cruisers, the New Orleans has gone down. The submarines managed to score a couple of torpedo hits. Oh, we know exactly where he is now, because he just pinged again. Depth charges away. I mean, the Alsace took a couple of big hits there. So the enemy submarine hasn't completely achieved nothing, but he is dead. Although it takes a ridiculous amount of depth charge hits to finish him off. But uh, yeah, that's how not to play a submarine. Instead of sticking with his team, so if that happened, the team can take care of the destroyer for you, and you just keep the destroyer spotted by popping up to periscope depth every now and then. Instead, and there was a 
flurry of kills there, by the way. Both teams have suffered two casualties and both teams control two of the cap circles. Oh, actually, another one. That The friendly Talon's having a real good start to the game. He's just racked up his second kill, and a very important kill, as far as Hapapol is concerned, because one of them was the enemy radar cruiser, the Chapayev. Hapa's popping smoke now, by the way, but it's not for him. It's for the friendly Alsace. He's dropping a defensive smoke screen for him so that the Alsace can get into cover behind one of these islands. It's kind of ironic, though, that submarines doing what submarines are realistically supposed to do, acting as lone wolves, is the fastest way to get your submarine killed in this game. Because without any kind of support and backup, well, why not close in for a depth charge attack on a submarine? And that is exactly what happened. Anyway, back to the Benham. Great torpedoes, and lots and lots of them. Decent speed, good range, and a very fast reload. That's about it, though, because everything else about this ship is distinctly mediocre. While not being exactly bad, I mean, the guns are a prime example, it's only got four of them. And they're, meh, I mean, they're all right. But you don't want to be getting into a gunfight in the Benham, if you can possibly avoid it. Not even with a Japanese destroyer, because it just stinks too much of a fair fight. And you don't want to be getting into fair fights if you can possibly avoid it. Fair fights are for suckers. Oh, enemy team have just suffered another casualty. The Algerie's gone down. And, oh, and another. <laughs> and Happer's team now have three of the four cap circles and a commanding points lead. But there's no such thing as a sure thing in World of Warships. I'm sure you've all seen far too many episodes of A Game of Throws to believe that the outcome of this match is already in the bag. Because even though Happer is now in the process of flipping that final cap circle, the outcome of this game is anything but decided. Anyway, back to the Benham. It seems pretty fast, doesn't it? I mean, that's almost 42 knots. Yeah, don't be deceived. Like the guns, the speed of this thing is actually kind of mediocre. It has a base top speed of only 36 and a half knots. Oh, and it's here where the enemy team start fighting back. They're contesting the cap circle at Alpha and they've just scored two kills. They're still behind, but, um, well, no spoilers. So yeah, the base speed of this ship is actually only 36.5 knots. Harper's running the Swift in Silence skill, which is effectively a not quite permanent engine boost, but it is as long as you're not detected. And he also had the engine boost running, so effectively a double engine boost, which will allow this thing to get up to 42 knots in a straight line. The second this thing starts manoeuvring, expect to lose 10 knots off that maximum speed. And if you're spotted, you'll obviously lose the swift and silent skill. And if the engine boost is on cooldown when that happens and you're getting shot at and you have to do the hippy hippy shake to avoid incoming fire, this thing will actually slow down less than 30 knots. A couple of torpedo hits there on the Colorado, which was finished off by the Alsace. I mean, the team, they're still ahead. They've still got a good points lead, and the enemy team don't actually hold any of the cap circles. They're contesting Alpha and Bravo, but they don't hold them just yet. Meanwhile, Hapafod is not exactly in a bad situation here. I mean, he's not detected. He's unlikely to be detected. But in attack... While the Benham's not bad, it's definitely not where it's at its best. Oh, team have just lost the destroyer. The enemy team have now equalised on the kills, and they're probably going to take that cap circle at Bravo. And while they're no longer contesting the cap circle at Alpha, the second they take care of the friendly submarine over there, they probably will be. What I mean when I say that the Benham isn't great in attack, I, I specifically mean it's not fantastic when it comes to chasing down and pursuing retreating enemies, which is basically what's happening over here. Oh, enemy team have flipped Bravo, and they are contesting Alpha again. A couple of these torpedoes are looking good. But the problem with... Oh, I think he's actually only going to get one torpedo hit there. Yeah. But the problem with chasing after enemies and trying to sink them with torpedoes is that if your torpedoes are doing 65 knots and the enemies are fleeing at 30 knots, that means your torpedoes are only catching up at a relative speed of 35, which is pretty damn slow. Plus, even with 10.5 kilometer range, the Benham stealth isn't great. The best you can have is a surface detection range of 5.9 kilometers, which means you've got to get really, really close before you launch those torpedoes to give the torpedoes a fighting chance of catching up to whatever's running away from you before those torpedoes run out of range. And that puts you a lot closer to 
enemy firepower than you prefer to be in this ship. On the other hand, when it comes to fighting a defensive battle, I don't think there's a better ship in the game. Oh dear, the enemy team have just scored another two kills. They are now ahead on kills. They are flipping the cap circle at Alpha. They do have possession of the cap circle at Bravo. Happer, evening the scores. Well, not the scores, but evening the kills. The team are still a good 250 points ahead. But evening the kills by getting the torpedo, I think it was actually flooding damage that sank the enemy Masashi. One of the only things on this end of the map that wasn't actually running away from him, which of course is why he sent his torpedoes after it in the first place. But the reason why I... Ooh, that Bismarck's in trouble. <laughs> What's he going to do? Turn and give broadside to a Georgia? Anyway, trying to stay on topic. Um... The reason I say that this, in my opinion, is probably the best defensive ship in the game. While it's not terrible in attack, it excels in defense. Because if you're retreating away, even if you're on your own against a strong enemy flank attack, you have the enemy speed working for you. If they're charging towards you at 30 knots, that means that your torpedoes are charging towards them at a relative speed of 95 knots. And that's really, really hard to dodge. And providing you're not being outspotted by a smart submarine player or another destroyer on the same flank with better stealth than you, or there's an aircraft carrier in play, I realise that's a lot of butts, but um, I've been in situations where I've managed to cock block half the enemy team by myself in this ship and keep them terrified of these torpedoes and constantly manoeuvring and slowing and and doing anything but pushing around the flank and catching the rest of the team in a crossfire just by virtue of being there and launching walls of skill at them every 85 seconds. A lone Benham can do that. I've seen it done. I've done it myself. If you absolutely, definitely have to defend an entire flank by yourself, USS Benham accept no substitutes. Oh, I'm going to refer back to another previous World of Warships video here. Do you remember the Stalingrad video on Tuesday? I was talking about how insanely dangerous it is to try to pull off a torpedo ambush on anything if you don't have anybody spotting it for you as it comes around the corner because by the time you see it, it sees you and its guns are a lot faster than your torpedoes. Well, unlike in Tuesday's video, Happer had the benefit of the Alsace, whose arse he saved earlier, spotting the Vladivostok for him as he came around the corner and just to make sure he's popped his smoke and of course with the Alsace still spotting him he can still see him and the Vladivostok don't worry he's not getting out of this one alive should have damn well known better because it was pretty obvious somebody else was in this cap circle with him and the only thing that it could have been because he is now the last ship left alive on his team was a Benham Benhams have torpedoes don't you know well, if he didn't know before, he certainly knows now. And for a fraction of a second there, right after the Alsace went down, Happer was actually the last ship left alive on his team against four enemies. Note that he is not sitting inside the smokescreen. Not that he's worried about any torpedoes from the Vladivostok, but he needs to spot. And you, well, smokescreens work both ways. Unless you're sitting inside a smokescreen with radar, you can't see out of it either. He's deliberating, taking this cap circle. I mean, he's got a more or less 200 point lead. But, while he can see the Roma, although he can't now, he's waiting for his torpedoes to come off cooldown. But he lost sight of him seconds ago, so he's still got a fairly good idea of which way to launch these torpedoes. But the fact that there is now somebody else inside this cap circle with him, and it's not the Roma, means he needs to get out of here. Because if he's sharing this cap circle with the enemy HMS Sturdy, and he might, I mean the Sturdy's not a particularly fast submarine, but he hasn't been spotted in about eight minutes, and when he was last spotted he was right next door over there in cap circle alpha, so that could be him on the surface on the other side of that island. And you don't want, I mean you all saw what happened in last week's video, you don't want to get spotted by a submarine who knows what they're doing in front of any number of enemy guns. He did score a torpedo hit in the flood on the Roma, though, but it wasn't enough to sink him. He doesn't know it's the Sturdy, of course. I mean, it could be the Georgia, but let's not stick around and find out the hard way. Note, because it's always useful to remind people that he does have his anti-aircraft and secondary guns turned off. Not that the depth charge attack planes that the Roma is launching are going to spot him, 
But if his AA guns open up and somebody's paying attention, they'll see the tracer and they'll know which way you went. Oh, on a related issue, I don't know if you've seen the uh, recent dev blogs, they're nerfing the aircraft spotting range of aircraft carriers. Except they aren't really. <laughs> if you're a battleship or a cruiser player, oh, it looks like it was the Georgia in the cap circle. But yes, if you're a battleship or a cruiser player, uh, it's really, really good news because they're, ooh, he's got the Roma. <sighs> Two against one. Still no sign of the sturdy. But anyway, yes, aircraft spotting range and why it's not absolutely great news for everybody. If you're a battleship or a cruiser player, it's great news because they're reducing the range at which a carrier's aircraft will spot you. If you're a destroyer player, it's not such good news because they're making the air spotting range of destroyers four kilometers. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, and it isn't a lot, but when you think that even a ship like the Benham with kind of bad stealth has an air spotting range at the moment of less than three kilometers. This is nothing but a nerf for destroyers. Also, because, well, it wouldn't be World of Warships if they were just nerfing carriers without also buffing them at the same time, uh, to compensate for the increased theoretical rate at which their aircraft will get shot down by battleships and cruisers, they're increasing the rate at which their aircraft regenerate. Because of course they are. Meanwhile, Happer, still 300 points ahead, flooding the ocean behind him with torpedoes in an effort to, if not outright, sink the Georgia. I mean, that would be great, but at the very least, slow him down as he manoeuvres to avoid the torpedoes, buying Happer a bit of breathing space here, because the Georgia is definitely going to try to flip the cap circle at Delta. And with the enemy team less than 300 points behind and just under four minutes of the battle remaining, a two-cap lead might be enough. Now, understand that this is not an ideal situation for the Georgia to be in, because this is precisely the kind of situation in which the Benham excels. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Okay, so there's the Confederate award, and Happer is obviously running Bull Halsey as his captain, which means torpedo reload time has just been reduced. His torpedoes are now... Wow. <laughs> 58 second torpedo reload. Oh, that George has got to be sweating bullets. But Happer has to be real careful he doesn't screw this up. He needs to think about which way he's going to go now. Because the Georgia is flipping the cap, and he hasn't sunk him. And those torpedoes missed. So, more torpedoes away from this side. You see, he can head south and try to skirt around, but that will put him behind the Georgia. And right after the George has finished flipping the cap at Delta, he's probably going to head north and try to do the same up at Charlie. I don't know where the Sturdy is, by the way. I don't understand why it hasn't already flipped the cap at Charlie. Okay, he's running north. And that kind of makes sense, because while there is an excellent chance that this may mean he's going to run into the Sturdy, because I have literally zero idea whatever else that Sturdy might be doing, if he does run into the Sturdy... Oh, more torpedo hits. Again, not enough to sink him, but that's a permanent flood, and there are more torpedoes in the water. But yes, if he does run into the Sturdy while running north, he's got that island that he can hopefully keep between himself and the Georgia. And that's exactly what's happened. So if he runs into that Sturdy now, he's good. He doesn't have to worry about the Georgia. Keeping an eye on those torpedoes, though. See what they're up to. And yep, there's another hit. Again, not enough to get a kill, but it did cause another flood. The Georgia now has a double flood. And Happer's hauling ass north as fast as this thing will go. He doesn't have any more engine boosts, but he does have the swift and silent skill as long as he remains undetected. So if the worst happens and the Sturdy does spot him now, well, he doesn't have to worry about getting shot at by the Georgia. And there it is. Wow, it took him long enough. But the Georgia is on the other side of the island. And Happer doesn't even shoot at the Sturdy. He just target locks him. Sturdy tries for a ping, and then he thinks, oh no, there's a destroyer locked me up. He sees Happer turn towards him and immediately loses his bottle, submerges, allowing Happer to once again go undetected, to once again gain the benefit of the 8% speed boost from the Swift in Silence skill, just in time for the Georgia to not be able to shoot at him. Or in other words, a kind of long-winded way of saying, the submarine did exactly the wrong thing at exactly the right time. 
Hab is thinking about maybe, I mean there's less than 30 seconds left. He was actually considering taking some gunshots at the Georgia to maybe set a fire and get himself the Kraken unleashed. But if he had gotten spotted, the Georgia just needs to get lucky once with a devastating strike. And this is the sort of thing episodes of a game of throws are made from. So instead he played it safe. There's absolutely no reason for him to take any chances here. He's got the win. Oh, and the Sturdy pops up and spots him right after the game has already been lost. Day late and the dollar short. Honestly, no idea what that Sturdy was doing for the last 10 minutes, but I'm sure Happer Fodder isn't complaining. Happer Fodder in the USS Benham, earning himself a Confederate, a solo warrior, and a high caliber, while demonstrating a textbook example of how to not end up starring in your own personal episode of A Game of Throws. Hope you all enjoyed it. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.